we're going to take a look at a cartridge we haven't shown on Ultimate Reloader before from the 70s, the 1870s. Gavin Gee here from UltimateReloader.com. I'm back with Guy Miner. Guy, thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. This, is, this has been fun so far, and I think it's going to get better. Yeah. Earlier today, I shot 45 Colt for the first time, believe it or not. I know. Not hugely different than 44 Mag, but a lot of fun, and there's a lot of history here. There is. There is. This cartridge came out, adopted by the Army in 1873 in the original old Colt single action Army revolver. And uh, it stayed in the military for quite a while, got replaced by a 38. We found ourselves in a fight over in the Philippines, not doing well with 38s. <laughs> 45s got hauled back out of the armory and did much, much better. Wow. Which then led, of course, to the Army liked things in 45 caliber, and we got a 1911 out of that eventually. With 45 ACP. Yeah. Also Colt. There's a little confusion there when you talk about a 45 Colt, you know, there or 45 is. Auto. Those are two different things, but yeah, can get a little bit confusing. Yes, and they're totally different cartridges other than diameter. Interesting. So, yeah. So here's what I think we should do. I think uh, you should give us a brief tour of the 45 Colt chambered handguns that you have here, these revolvers. And then um, you've done a couple loads here. We could talk about that in the performance. Sure. And then I want you to guide me through the process of loading. Okay. I think I can handle it. I, I think you can handle it. Yeah, good old Lyman gear. You're pretty yep. familiar with that stuff. Oh yes. Okay. That's right. Yeah. But you know, I haven't loaded 45 Colt before, so this is this is new. Yep. It's uh, it's interesting, and um, we'll get into that. But it's real interesting because you've got two distinct power levels to deal with, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll get into that. Okay. Talk about the revolvers here. The oldest one that I've got is this Smith and Wesson, and it was actually, this one was produced for only a few years during World War I. It's marked 455 Webley, and it was built for the British and Canadian forces in World War I who did not have enough handguns to go around. So Smith & Wesson kindly tooled up uh, to build 455 Webleys for them. Somehow, somewhere along the line, this one got reworked to hmm. take 45 Colt which is, of course, much easier to come by here in the USA. Yeah. Um, it's not that different from today's end frame Smith & Wessons, other yeah. than, you know, it's uh, 100 plus years old, uh, well-worn. Sadly, at some point in its life, it got stored in a damp environment, and it's yeah. got some pitting. Yep. Um, Call it character. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> right. character. Yep. Um, yeah. It's like my 1905, it's got this color case hardened hammer, and it's funny that Sometimes those parts don't, you know, corrode as much as some of the other blued steel and things like that. Just a, a classic, though, and you think of the history and heritage, and, you know, it's fun to shoot. It's fun to put these, you know, into use. We shot the the Colt earlier, and that was, that was quite fun. Just to think of different, you know, times gone by, you, you know, World War I, this was before people owned cars, right? I mean... Well, most people anyway. Yeah. 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 Um, Malty had just been introduced, maybe, you know, so it was, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, from back a long time ago. Yeah. And that cartridge has kind of a stellar history. Interesting, we've got the black powder on display because, mm -hmm. it, not because I used black powder, but because the original charge was 40 grains of black powder and a 250 ish grain bullet. Hmm. I forget if it was a 250 or 255 at 1,000 feet per second. And that was just a little more recoil than a lot of people could handle, so they stepped it down. <laughs> Um, but that's wow. why I, I brought that on in. It's kind of a really nice, cool. nice keepsake. And yeah, it's actually got black powder in it. I might have to do something about that. It's probably 80 or 100 years old. I don't know. <laughs> um, so there you go. Cool. Next gun is a Colt New Service. And when I was a kid, that was my grandfather's gun. Very nice guns. Uh, at the time that they were built in the 20s and 30s, they were uh, Colt's biggest revolver. Hmm. And later on, when it was introduced, uh, they were chambered for the 357 Magnum as well. This one's 45 Colt. Uh, pretty much all original. I think the bluing may have been redone at some point. And I put the grips on because it had a pair of uh, really kind of nasty grips on it. They were not the originals. They were hmm. something else. It shoots surprisingly well. Yeah. 
Um, backstrap is marked, interesting, NYST, New mm -hmm. York State Trooper. Uh, yeah. My grandfather was not New York State Trooper, so he bought it after New York State surplus these. Wow. You know, do you have an idea of when this was manufactured? I believe it was made in the early 30s, but I'd have to check that with the Colt history book. So it's getting close to 100 years old, and it shoots wow. really well. So it might have been involved in some sort of New York Mafia type engagements or who uh, knows what? You know, <laughs> back there towards the end of Prohibition and yep. some of the gang stuff going on and yeah. all that. Yeah. Wow. So it could well have been involved in some of that. That's, that's, who knows? That's really cool. I what like I, that. I noticed when I, um, I've had it for about 40 years now, and I noticed mm -hmm. the first time I took it out and just put some, some factory ammo through it, mm -hmm. that it was amazingly accurate. Mm -hmm. The sights are on. Now, that was 40 years ago. My eyes were 40 years younger. <laughs> I have a hard time shooting it as well now, but it still shoots good. Interesting. Yeah. So. Next one is a single axe revolver by Ruger, Ruger Blackhawk. This one uh, came into dad's life in I think the late 70s hmm. and uh, been, been living at my place for quite some time now. Take it out and shoot it once in a while. I do not know if the brass grip frame was original from hmm. Ruger or was an aftermarket piece. I don't know. It's been that way ever since dad first showed it to me. So. The um, interesting thing about that revolver is it not only takes 45 Colt, but has a spare cylinder for 45 ACP. That's cool. It is. And, it's a, the, and the Ruger gives us a chance to load the 45 Colt up to a much higher level mm -hmm. than we can do with the old revolvers. Yeah, so is that the two different levels that you yeah. were talking about previously? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The old level uh, and the, the hand loads that Hodgden has for that are listed at 14,000 CUP and below. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's pretty, you can still get 1,000 feet per second out of a 250 grain bullet in that area. So even, even these old guns mm -hmm. can bark with authority, a heck of a lot more power than most 45 ACP loads. Um, kind of like a mid range 44 Magnum load. So when you're loading this ammunition, you must have to be careful about how it's marked and which ammunition you put into which uh, revolver because yes, yeah, yeah this if, one being more stout. If all I had was the old guns, you know, no problem. Or mm -hmm. actually, if all I loaded was four, if, they, if I loaded them all down mm -hmm. to uh, the old gun level, that would be easy, but I don't. Right. I, I load some pretty stout stuff for this Ruger and yeah, it would probably damage or just take apart an old gun. Mm -hmm. So how close to 44 mag performance can you get with 45 Colt? Right there, and there are some people who say you can get better than 44 gotcha. mag uh, at lower pressures because, oh, wow. it's, because it's a bigger case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can push a 360 grain bullet out of it uh, 335 grain bullet. I've got, loaded some 300s here mm -hmm. for today, mm -hmm. um, and no problem getting those 300s at a thousand feet per second. And there was plenty of room left. Wow. Yeah, could it could have bumped them up higher. Honestly, I didn't want to shoot them any faster than that. Right. <laughs> and I was okay with that. <laughs> oh. Nice. So why don't we talk about your loads that you that you shot for this story and. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Came up with uh, two loads, one of uh, which is in that nice, mild, easy shooting thing for the old guns, and that was um, eight and a half grains of CFE pistol. And yep. Hornady makes a swaged lead bullet for that, 255 grains. They've got it marketed, I think, mostly at the cowboy action shooter crowd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes a real nice plinker. It's accurate. It's easy to load. There's no crimp groove in it, so I just mm -hmm. crimp right into the sides of the soft lead bullet. Um, you could you could also use a taper crimp on that. Mm -hmm. That would work real well. Um, standard primer, eight and a half grains, and we're getting around 800 feet per second out of it. Mm -hmm. So you just shot a cylinder full of them, and yeah, that was uh, no big deal. Yeah, definitely. Uh, kind of a little bit more than my real light. 44 mag load, which was 4.3 greens of CFE pistol. Oh, actually, okay. that was W231. Two, two right, yeah. a similar a similar powder. So it'd be interesting to take, I think, the power level down even a little bit more, you know, to see where the sweet spot is for just easy plinking, you know, low recoil type stuff. Yeah. Um, but that that's a versatile load because you know it'd be you could use it for a defensive load or certainly or could it, I think it would deal with most situations mm -hmm. um, 
Then I got a little crazy, but not a lot crazy. Uh, I've had I've, I've shot this one. It had a little uh, little hotter load than I kept, felt like dealing with. Okay. Um, and, and it was it was all legit and everything, but it was like wow, that hurt. So this one is about a grain under max. Okay. For for this, and it's uh, we're pushing that big 300 grain hard cast bullet from Cast Performance. It's a gas check bullet and a big flat oh, nice. uh, me flat on the front. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a good bullet, and that those set of loads are limited to 29,000 uh, psi for the most mm -hmm. part. And yeah, 17 and a half grains, we're getting around 1,000 feet per second out of it. And that's accurate number nine on that one? That was accurate number nine. Gotcha. Yep, thank you for reminding me to say that. Which I have not used. I have used a lot of that in the 500 Smith & Wesson when I had mine. Okay, gotcha. And I've loaded quite a bit of 44 mag with it. It works really well to uh, very easy flowing through the powder measure. Mm -hmm. So that makes it nice. Awesome. Yeah, they're uh, three good guns and a couple of good loads and... It was fun. It would be interesting to see. We were just talking before filming about uh, lever guns in 45 Colt. Yeah. It'd, it'd be interesting to see what kind of velocity you would get with that more stout load, you know, with, with a longer barrel. It is. And uh, maybe if we even took it up to the book max um, mm -hmm. and then shot it out of, a, say, a 20 inch carbine, that would be pretty cool. Nice. So maybe we'll get one. Yeah. Well, can I get hands on and load some of these? Sure, why not? Okay, we will do that next. So we've got some nice orange gear here, huh? The, we uh, do. The beam scale from Lyman. We've got the Lyman powder measure, which I, I like the way this adjusts. It's got the coarse and fine on it, which makes it easy to kind of get things into the right range and then dial in. And then we've got the All American 8, eight stations of goodness. <laughs> really nice, yeah. Back to the powder measure for a yep. second. One of the most practical things I like about it is when I'm done loading and I've got some powder left, mm -hmm. very easy to take that top part off and yes. pour the powder right back in its container. Yep. Very easy to do that instead of unscrewing the whole thing. Right. You know, how many turns do I have <laughs> to do this? So, yep. and then coming over to the, the turret press here with eight stations. I'm using four of them for this mm -hmm. this loading. I have the uh, sizer decapper yep. and then the flaring or billing yep. and then seating and then a separate seating die for crimping. Yep. And, and that's so a nice roll crimp. These cases you've already sized and primed. Right. Like. Okay right. so we're gonna charge each case. It looks like we were just validating the charge so it yep. should be good to go on that. We're going to flare. Flare it. Makes it easier for the oh, lead yeah. bullet to go in. And then we're going to take one of our cast performance bullets. Yep. I always do a final powder check. Me too. Before we do that. Just in case. Okay, that looks good. And then roll crimp. And that is a Ooh, big yeah. old top heavy, nicely crimped 300 grain, 45 <laughs> Colt. I like that. Okay, so we're going to pick up the pace a little bit. Oh, I haven't loaded on a turret in a while. Yeah, it doesn't take care of it for you. you got to do no, it. No, you have to really think about each thing, right? But, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about kind of what, what mood you're in and how much time you have, you know? Yeah. I would almost, this is ambi, I would almost put the handle on the other side if I had it set up this way. Okay. There's something satisfying about loading on a turret. It gives you that feeling of a single stage but with a little bit more uh, efficiency. Yeah, I can actually load you know, pistol cartridges pretty quickly on this thing. So, not like, not like a full-blown progressive. Yeah, we'll get you we'll get you more comfortable with the progressive thing here shortly. Cuz when uh, when we're doing full auto with some of this stuff, <laughs> out of the CMG CMMG banshees or something, you're going to want to be able to kind of nice go. to have a whole bucket of ammo. Yeah, exactly. So, flare. Last one. Seat. Crimp, 
There we go. Five cartridges ready to roll. That was easy. Yeah. Good deal. So, 45 Colt. I've done it. I've loaded it now and I've shot it. And you've shot it. All in the last hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if you want to shoot some of those 300 grainers, feel free. Yeah. That's uh, probably only, something we should do next. Only out of the Ruger. Nice. Yes. Yeah. A little bit, a little bit stout for the older, uh, weaker frames. Huh? They, they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Elmer Keith actually did some stuff with the 45 Colt that you probably shouldn't do, <laughs> including ruining one. Oh wow. Uh, yeah. So it talks about it in his book, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. So that's that's actually when he went to the 44 Special to get those thicker walls. Gotcha. Um, yeah, went to 44 Special, loaded that up nice and warm, and that eventually became 44 Magnum. Revolver, revolver stuff just fascinates me. Yeah. Um, and especially the big bores. I really enjoy the experience of both loading for revolvers. It's nice not to have to chase down on, the, on your hands and knees in the weeds for the brass. Yes. It just goes right back into the bucket. Uh, you don't have the semi-auto semantics of needing to get the slide back and all that. You can kind of it's a it's a it's a blank canvas. I feel like you know when it comes to loading, from mild to wild, you've got the strength to go to extremes you can't in the semi-auto. Typically, yeah, you can beef up a semi-auto that weighs thirty pounds. You, you can, convert, you but can, but it's easy to just buy an off-the-shelf Ruger, either either a single-action mm -hmm. Blackhawk or their Red Hawk, the double action, and load them up nicely. Yeah, awesome. Well, here's our question for you: Is what are you doing with 45 Colt? What kind of firearms are you shooting? What kind of loads are you loading? What kind of bullets? What kind of powder? What kind of equipment are you using? Drop a comment and tell us all about it. Thank you, Guy, for bringing your gear and your guns and letting me load some of the ammo. That was a lot of fun. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I like these things. That concludes this video, and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, where we've got unrestricted content, and Instagram. Make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities, including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're going to want to go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you're interested in becoming a professional gunsmith, check out the Sonoran Desert Institute. They've got a degree program, they've got a certificate program, and you can study from home. Learn more at sdi.edu. Thanks again for watching. That's the thing about single action, slow to load, <laughs> slow to unload. Yeah. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> Good old SAA, right? You can barely hold on to the grip. Yeah, that's, uh, that's rowdy. Well, it was fun. <laughs> I like isn't, that. Isn't that thing fun? Yeah. I actually had a, uh, a lady in one of my shooting classes try it, and she was a horse, horseback riding person. Yep. She absolutely loved it. In fact, at the, after she shot it, she says, I need to write down what this is so my husband will know what to get me for Christmas. <laughs> That's awesome. Was it your dad's, did you say? Or? It was dad's, and he bought it used. Okay. He, also, he bought the same time he bought that 357 that looks the same. <laughs>